Welcome everyone to Almost Cancelled, I am Peter and today I'm going to be talking about Loki Season 1 Episode 2, it's called The Variant. So, full spoilers for the episode. And speaking of spoilers, um, I totally guessed the, the Lady Loki thing uh, last episode. I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't, you know, betting money on it, but uh, the idea occurred to me and sure enough. What stuck out to me about this is that early on in the episode, I actually became convinced that it was going to be a female Loki because of the sequence where they, they met out of their way to make it very clear that these other Lokis can be different. You know, the little joke scene where they're showing the holograms of these other variant Lokis and there's one that's sort of got long hair and there's one that's monstrous and it's you know, a variety of different things and Loki's reactions are playing off of it. It was very notable to me that they were setting up that idea so they could pay it off probably at the end of the episode and sure enough uh that's the case there's some interesting concepts in this one um i particularly enjoy the idea that a variant can hide at a part of the timeline where everyone is about to die in the vicinity and therefore there's no branches caused and therefore the tva will not pick up any anomalies and they won't be alerted to the fact that someone's causing ripples in time with their presence. Uh, the example given, of course, is Pompeii, where uh, they go to test this theory and Loki intentionally, you know, causes a ruckus and releases the goats and shouts at everyone and looks very smug as the volcano uh, erupts behind him. But I thought it was a really neat idea. That was a, a fun way of playing with some of the rules that they're setting up. Um, Rules which they're kind of firing at us a little bit right now. You know, the idea is of, right, of uh, there being a time limit once a branch is created to fix the branch before it ruins the timeline, stuff like that. Um, they're, they're kind of setting these things up, but I, I do think that was an interesting... You know, it makes enough sense to me, <laughs> you know, at a, at a base level. That idea. That I kind of dug it. So, I'm into that. Uh, my moment of the episode might actually be kind of a similar beat to something that happened in the first episode, but it kind of we we kind of glossed over the destruction of Asgard when he when Loki was watching some of the stuff from the later movies, and when he's in the failing library uh, in this episode and he's been told to you know research all the past cases to see if he can come up with any you know clues or anomalies or anything like that, um he ends up with files about. Asgard, so the only things allowed to take out, and he, you know, basically discovers that you know Ragnarok happened and the destruction of Asgard and the the population was wiped out, and there's a there's a moment of emotion, there's a moment of uh, him reacting, which I thought was even better, like a scene later when he goes to see Owen Wilson and we get the the amusing sequence of him trying to use uh, Owen Wilson's lunch <laughs> as a metaphor to explain his apocalypse theory, but. He, it was a joke in that scene where he brings up Ragnarok and Owen Wilson, you know, Mobius says, oh yes, I'm familiar, you know, I'm sorry. You know, as if it would be something that most people would be kind of, you know, hit by, you know, reading about the destruction of their home world, their homeland. And Loki very amusingly sort of goes, oh yes, it's very sad. Anyway, it got me thinking. And it's kind of a joke. And that's, that's funny on its own. That's a funny little beat that plays into Loki's character. But it actually had a lot more weight behind it because we'd actually seen him react genuinely when he was reading the file and we could see the emotion in his eyes. So those two scenes happening back to back actually give us more layers to Loki as a character because not only is he doing the funny Loki reaction where he just sort of brushes it aside, now we know he's lying as he does it. Now we know he is putting on a brave face as he does it. And that gives us a little bit more depth to Loki as a character. Uh, and there's some parts of this scene that were in the trailers, of course, uh, the, you know, you've literally stabbed someone in the back 50 times, and he's like, well, I'll never do it again. And that's the charm, obviously, that's very, uh, you know, endearing about Tom Hiddleston as Loki. Um, I also particularly like that once again, Loki, because I wasn't really a big fan of this scene, the first time they go out to a crime scene this episode, and Loki sort of starts giving this speech about, no, 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 the, the, the variant, the evil Loki's out there. And he's probably going to kill you. And he says, you know, we've got to do this. He's got to do that. So you have to trust me. And, we're going to... and he spends this time making this speech. And then Owen Wilson just sort of goes, no, nah, he's lying. That's just, there's no one out there. And they just go. I kind of loved that once it got to that point, because 
I actually felt it was too obvious that it was all bullshit before. I was like, wait, that sounds believable. Uh, to the point where if he wasn't just blatantly lying, it would have probably been a problem for like how it expects the audience to react. But obviously once it turned out to clearly be a lie, and it was clearly just him trying to do his usual Loki tricks, it worked and it made for an entertaining beat. I will say, so this is the crime scene where they're investigating the incident that happened at the start of the episode. The opening scene of the episode is the actress from uh, Sasha Lane, who was in the Hellboy movie from a couple of years ago, and she was also in uh, the newer version of Utopia that got cancelled after one season at Amazon. Um, so she's in part of this team. She's, you know, one of these uh, Minutemen. Uh, she's the leader of the squad. And they set up in this scene that the the villainous Loki can take over someone's body, uh, for, at least for a brief time. And that's a mechanic that's used throughout the episode. We, we see it again later on. Um, I thought this scene, sadly, was a little poor. Um, I found myself kind of noticing that the direction was lacking any good sense of momentum. And it felt like a scene that was missing like the just the coolness that it was going for. To the point where, you know, uh, Bonnie Tyler's Holding Out for a Hero starts playing, right? Which is a nice song. It's a fun 80s song. And all I could help feel in this scene was that this song, I mean, maybe it was always planned to be there, but it really genuinely felt like it was being used to try and cover up the fact that the scene was lacking the, 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 the momentum and the personality, or any personality. There were just little moments where it felt like it wanted to do those little beats in a scene like this where so so the you know Sasha Lane's character uh starts you know killing the other team members but the actual deaths aren't that exciting part of it's probably because it's keeping it to you know no more than PG-13 but there's a real lack of motion to it it feels like it kind of stops and starts a little bit the way those little moments where she kind of stares at someone before she does the next bit uh it I can see what they were trying to do, but I don't think it worked. I don't think the, the director of the scene of this episode qu quite nailed the momentum of this. It's the same director as the first episode, I think, which was fine. And the rest of the episode is is, is solid enough. There's, there's nothing wrong with it. It was just this scene in particular. It felt like it was missing uh, this the sense of motion and coolness that I think it was supposed to have. And maybe the song was already picked out anyway. But it really felt like it was trying to hide the fact that there wasn't really much personality or feeling to the scene. Um, I didn't get a whole lot out of this. It felt a little bit amateurish in its execution to me. Um, it just it felt like something wasn't clicking with it. Uh, every time uh, she stopped and looked before going to attack the next person, or when then you know the Loki came in and slit the person's throat, it all just felt a bit disjointed. And maybe it was just oh, this was actually too violent and they had to, like, trim it down and it feels a little bit weird because of that. Maybe it's just because this is not a type of scene this director excels at. All, all could be reasons, but regardless, something felt a little bit off about it and I felt like, it felt like the music was trying to, you know, jazz it up. <laughs> like, here, here's some personality. And it didn't, I, I didn't really feel like it fit either. Like, it, it, I, I don't, it, tonally, it didn't feel like it was ironic. It didn't feel like it was anything i don't know it just it felt it felt really tacked on it felt really tacked on and i think it was because it was trying to add some life to a scene that felt honestly kind of lifeless uh given what the scene was supposed to be so i will critique that opening scene for the episode uh you know otherwise yeah it's loki's you know awkwardly try to fit in with everyone um you know at times maybe he comes a little bit across too I don't know, silly in co comedy or comedic, but uh, for the most part, still very charming and plays into his, stre into his strengths. Uh, you know, he goes with them on this mission because he thinks he's found the right apocalypse that the, the variant Loki is going to be hiding at uh, in 2050. And it's, uh, they call it, was it Rock Smart? I know, it's, obviously it's a play on Rock Roxon, the company Roxon from, from Marvel, which I don't know if they had Roxon in the MCU much yet. I don't, I don't remember them popping up. Maybe they get mentioned. I think they've been maybe mentioned. But were they mentioned in One Division? That sounds plausible. I feel they've been mentioned before, but anyway. Uh, they go in and we have the sequence that kind of 
we have some of the other characters get taken over by the variant Loki and talking to our Loki. Loki tries to build an alliance and say, hey, I want to take down the timekeepers, all this, uh, you know, three lizards controlling the timeline nonsense. And there's some talk of that in this episode as well, where Owen Wilson tries to make it clear what, he, what his beliefs are and uh, the, the timekeepers, once they entangle whatever the ending to the timeline is, is that the, the job's done and there's no, nothing else to, to do at that point. And Loki brings up the question of like, so there's not really any free will then if everything's predetermined and yada yada yada. Themes that I'm sure the show is going to keep playing with and the idea of what it really means to be on this fixed path that's not supposed to be deviated from. Um, But, you know, as it turns out, Variant Loki uh, declines the offer, uh, beats him up a little bit and uh, sets off a a timer and it's not a bomb i mean technically because so we get these like time bomb things that sort of fix the the branch right if as long as they do it before the red line uh within the time limit they can sort of like basically eradicate a branch uh, and patch the timeline up and it seems like variant loki's get a bunch of these which then go through all these little time portals the same sort of portals they open when they're walking through time and they're going to different parts of the timeline. We cut back to the you know TVA and we see all the branches coming off like all over the place. So it's just, it's just causing chaos with the timeline. So that's obviously raising the stakes for where we're going. The episode ends with Loki running through the, the same door that the variant Loki, right after revealing, of course, that she is a female and uh, has a very different look, has one broken horn on the, uh, the headdress, you know, uh, so then it ends kind of on that cliffhanger. I guess the other thing that I would want to mention is that the episode does a little bit more with trying to establish the relationship between Mobius um, and uh, was it Renslayer is Guguma Bathara's character uh, and how he keeps going to her for approval for things and she clearly trusts him uh, there's a camaraderie there but uh, she's very doubtful of Loki's usefulness and whatnot it does not look very happy at the end of the episode when everything goes completely uh so we'll see more more of that stuff i'm sure as as we go on um but yeah so opening scene i thought was quite poor in its direction and i felt like the music was trying to cover up for it but i do think the ideas in this episode are interesting i'll be curious to see loki playing off of uh of lady loki the variant loki whatever we're going to call her now um I like the idea of hiding in apocalypses because it wouldn't cause any time variance because everyone's going to die there anyway and therefore nothing will be affected by it. That's a neat idea. I think that's kind of cool. Um, and some more character building with Loki with him sort of, you know, reacting to the Asgard, you know, Ragnarok stuff, but then kind of like seeing him hide that to another character when we know, when we're in on it because we saw him react already makes him a more layered character and it was one of the more interesting little beats I thought of the episode. So, yeah. There you go. Solid episode two. Um, I thought it advanced things quite well. Uh, the effects when they popped up, you know, the volcanic eruption did look pretty nice behind Loki. Um, I like some of the little details. There's, there's not a lot that's different about the future because, you know, this supermarket they go to is in the future the, towards the end of the episode. And we see... There's like a hologram outside, uh, like a you know, like a hologram billboard, effectively, and the uh, the workers, the staff there, have like little hologram, not hologram, but they have little like LED like name tags that say other things on them. So just a little bit more advanced. Not none of the products seemed all that different, um, but you know, whatever. They don't want to go too far with it. It's only thirty years. Maybe one of the things that you know, movies and TV in the past have done is they've overestimated how much things are going to change. In the wrong ways, at least. Obviously, there's other things where, like, you know, you go back to the 80s and insert a smartphone into a scene and all of a sudden it ruins everything. Uh, but anyway, so that is uh, that is episode two of, of Loki. So we'll see how things wrap up. I mean, the, the ongoing plot is kind of interesting right now. Uh, it, it's definitely far more engaging than Falcon and Winter Soldier for me uh, right now, at least, as far as, as plot progression goes. Um, and they're doing some interesting things with Loki, so... Uh, also Loki arguing with a cartoon clock, also kind of, you know, charming enough. So, uh, that is episode two. Let me know what you thought of the episode yourself in the comments. Do like and subscribe and ding the bell for notifications. Uh, all of that does help YouTube channels uh, grow, so please do it. 
Uh, you can, of course, uh, support us uh, even more so over at patreon.com slash TV for as little as $1 per month and keep all the content coming. Um, but yeah, otherwise that is me. I'll also just uh, give a quick shout out to the Mail Fuzz Movies YouTube channel, which is now separate, uh, where the horror movie and sci-fi movie podcast, as well as uh, any other random movie content will now go. So uh, go and subscribe there too and check that stuff out also. So thank you very much once again for watching or listening. I always appreciate it. Keep watching TV. Have you got any vanilla?